Hey, oh, hey, oh, man. Um, hi, this is Ellie Leibowitz, and you're watching Tape with Rabbi Doug. Next. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're going to watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, everybody talk about that. Shalom and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. Glad you could be with us today. I'm so honored to have with me a Chicago boy who's back in Chicago doing what he does best, Ellie Leibowitz. Welcome to the show. Hey. Woo. And welcome to the studio audience. Um, before officially starting his comedy career, Ellie Leibowitz, a Chicago boy, actually uh, honed his comedic chops doing a Harry Carey impression while working as a vendor at Chicago Cubs games. And all those people that I was just on the podcast with that I mentioned to you before the show were all vendors. Also, though he did miss an occasional Friday in high school at Ida Crown Jewish Academy to sell hot dogs at Wrigley, it was part of a higher calling. When he attended Yeshiva University in New York, he'd go on to win the school's annual comedy contest in 2009. Since then, he's performed at communities all over the country, and in 2019, he did a sold-out multi-city tour in Israel, and he would do over 100 shows over Zoom in 2020 and 2021 during the pandemic. Some may find his material a bit too Jewish, but with a name like Eli Leibowitz, he wasn't going to try to hide that. He currently makes his home in Riverdale, New York, and as of 2023, he's now doing comedy full-time, and that's the rumor. You're doing this full-time, you're not doing anything else but comedy all the time. Gosh, your home must be a crack-up. <laughs> uh, not, not quite, but uh, I am doing a lot of laundry also. So, uh, so that's good. Yeah. Laundry, laundry and comedy go together well. Well, my wife just gives me a lot of errands to do while I'm home because I don't have so a let me, job. Let me ask you a serious question, and that is, um, you know, people, when you're in school, you have a, a, a career base in mind. You know, I'm going to major in this, and I'm going to do this for a living, and uh, I'm going to make a good living. I'm going to support my family and do what i got to do. And... Uh, uh, how do you decide to go into uh, show business full time and not to uh, kind of do it on the side while you're while you're making a living, as they say? Well, the truth is, I was doing it on the side for ten years plus. I was doing, um, I was working at, I worked at B and H, the which is like Santa's workshop with Hasidim, basically. It's an electronic store in New York. I was working at the Orthodox Union, a nonprofit, um, and I was working at a startup most most recently. Um, actually, when I was working at B and H. Um, one time, six months into getting and working there, I got an email. Me and like 25 other people were on this email that said um, it's they ordered pizza every Friday from uh, Bravo Pizza in, in, in Midtown New York, and it said there was no body of the email, it just said a subject line. It said somebody ordered pizza from Bravo under the name Ellie. Was this you? And it was me and 25 other people named Ellie on this email, and I wrote. Well, describe working at a Jewish company in one email. That's pretty much how it was. But uh, no, but I, I was working these side jobs. Up, but like I still, like I still maintain even comedy. Also, like working as a vendor at, at Wrigley Field was the best job I've, I've ever had. Yeah. As, as as a lot of people we know that did that and still do it. Some of them, some of my own congregants who went to Ida Crown and went to school are still. Uh, doing the vending part time. Well, yeah, your job was to go to a baseball game. I would literally walk around the stand doing. So I would really, I would do Will Ferrell's Harry Carey. I don't uh -huh. know if you know the sketch from whatever SNL. So Will Ferrell would do a Harry Carey. Where like, hey, who wants to get crazy? Come on! If you were a hot dog and you were starving, would you eat yourself? You have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyways, <laughs> for, the, for a younger crowd, no, I'm kidding. I've but, actually uh, seen. I've actually I, seen. I, it didn't seem like it. But no, I'm just kidding. But uh, the. Um, no, I would do this impression. People would give me money without even buying, which made me feel a little weird. But I would, uh, I would walk around the stadium. I got in a fight with Carlos Marmol, the pitcher, who was because in the Cub, the Wrigley Field bullpen. Um, I don't know what it's like now, but back in the day, you could really like literally just go up to the pitchers almost. Sure. Like as, so, every day I would walk around like you know, be like, "Hey, who wants ice cream? Come out!" And Carlos Marmol would always say, "Get him out of here." One time I got mad at him and I said, "Hey, Carlos." Why do why do I let, why don't you let me worry about my job? You worry about yours. The next day he blows the safe for the Cubs, as Carlos Marmol would do. And uh, I just wanted to hear the post game conference, post game interview after they were like, 
call us what happened. He's like, well, this vendor was doing this horrible Bill Cosby impression, and I don't know what happened. So. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I was working these side jobs, up, but like I still like I still maintain even comedy also like. Working as a vendor at, at Wrigley Field was the best job I've, I've ever had. Do you share events sometimes, uh, you know, comedy uh, uh, stand-ups with, with other Jewish comedians? Do you, get, do you like get in line and sometimes uh, have a bunch of comedians one after another doing stuff like that? Yeah, I did a show on uh, Christmas, sorry, December 24th. Yeah. I did a show <laughs> with uh, Joel Chasnoff. Oh, Joel Chasnoff um, also and, was my student. Yeah, so I did a show with him on Christmas uh, Eve and Joel Chasnoff. Um, Talia Reese is a comedian. I have worked uh, with Avi Lieberman, Elon Gold. Uh, I mean, Elon Gold has been on our show too. Yeah, so I've I've worked with you know I've done a, a ton of like lineups of, uh, of very comedians. Nice, very where, nice. Yeah. Well, this is great. Well, I, I'm looking forward to hearing your set. As is the audience, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ellie Leibowitz. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Nice. Uh, the uh, six people I paid to be here. No, I'm kidding. But. Uh, <laughs> It is great to be here. I, I, I was telling the rabbi, you know, I do perform for a lot of Jewish audiences and Jews are tough because Jews like something more than laughing and that's correcting people. And some of you didn't laugh at that because you're thinking, I don't know if he's right about that. So thank you for proving my point. Um, but I, 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 when I perform at a lot of Jewish events, you know, especially synagogues, they're very scared to have a comedian because they've had bad experiences with comedians in the past. And I know this because they tell me and they say, oh, well, yeah, I said, do you want to have a comedy then? And they said, well, we had a comedian in 1985. And he swore the whole time. And it was the worst Tisha B'Av we ever had. So, <laughs> arguably the best Tisha B'Av. Um, but uh, Jews, um, Jews are, are, are tough, tough to make laugh because Jews, um, there's, there's pressure to be funny right away. And that's in anything, but, but Jews especially. Because Jews hear you're a comedian, they're like, oh, you're a comedian? Prove it. That doesn't happen with other jobs. Nobody's ever like, oh, you're a Moel? Prove it! All right, stand back. And uh, I, I also like, listen, I do very clean material, because like, look at me, even if I told a dirty joke, it really wouldn't be believable. If I was like, you know, I was hooking up with this one girl, you'd be like, no, you weren't. You go back to why you. Um, one time that joke got 10 seconds of laughter, which is too much laughter, to be honest. And uh, it, somebody actually came up to me a show, after a show and said, I love how you have this like nebby, dorky persona on stage. And I had to go be like, yeah, persona. This takes a lot of work. Uh, the baldness is part of the act. But I, <laughs> but I, 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 I do very clean material because I know when, at com when I go to comedy clubs, comedians are usually you know, pretty dirty. They'll get up on stage and say things that I just can't relate to. They'll get up on stage and say things that I have a tough time connecting with as an Orthodox Jew. They'll get up on stage and be like, you know how you're in a club in Vegas doing cocaine? <laughs> no. Not even stuff like that, just stuff I can't relate to. They're like, you know how you're at a McDonald's? I'm like, let me stop you right there. I need a comedian to say something I can relate to. I need a comedian to get up on stage and be like, you know how when you're peeing and you sneeze and your yarmulke falls in the toilet? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Let's talk about Three Day Yom Tov. Uh, no, but I, listen, I am very proud of my Judaism, but there are just times you want to downplay it. You know, I was driving with a friend of mine and he was giving me a ride and he merged into this lane and he cut off about 20 cars as he merged into this lane. And he tells me, take your yarmulke off for this. And I said to him, you're driving a Honda Odyssey, okay? There might as well be a mezuzah on the door. You know, also, you have a bumper sticker that says Yeshiva of Flatbush, and right next to it, it says, thank you, Hashem. We're practically driving the mitzvah tank over here, but sure, I'll take my yarmulke off. And, uh, no, but also, the other time I would really want to downplay my Judaism is when I fly on Sukkot with my Lulu and Esro. You know, I'm just, I'm already self-conscious about having to walk through, you know, uh, the airport, like, you know, holding this giant tree, and I'm just like, is anyone gonna know I'm Jewish? All right, no one will know now. <laughs> I have to walk through security, and like, you know, first of all, you can't leave your bags unattended, so now I have to go to the bathroom with my lulav, and that just seems wrong. <laughs> just standing at the urinal at LaGuardia Airport, and people are just staring at you, and you gotta be like, you gotta give them the look like they're the crazy ones. <laughs> well, you've never seen a guy go to the bathroom with a tree before? What's your problem? And you know, I come out of the bathroom and like the you know the CSA they ask me is this thing you're carrying dangerous and you're like not really except every time I take it out of the plastic I stab myself in the hand. <laughs> but uh, no, but but then like you know I realize that that Orthodox Jews are very very public with our religiosity. You know it's very obvious to you know with with who's, who's an Orthodox Jew and I realize people that aren't Jewish don't always have that. I think Catholics the closest thing I think Catholics have is something called Ash Wednesday, where 40 days before Easter, Catholics the religious ones they put ashes on their forehead 
And whenever I see someone with ashes on their forehead, I can't help but think to myself, I gotta start cleaning for Pesach. Wow, that is coming up. Thank you for the reminder. And no, but, but so, so, you know, I'm coming out of the bathroom with my love and, you know, the woman in American Airlines, she says to me, she says, what is that? And I'm like, it's like a religious tree, I don't know. And she says, do you plant it? And they gotta be like, no, you idiot, you shake it. <laughs> Duh, how is that not the first verb on your list? I also think Sukkot and Sukkot is a very, is designed at a really purposeful time. It's right after Yom Kippur. And I feel like the angels are saying to God, aren't you worried that the Jews, now that they're all sinless, are gonna do whatever they want, now that they're all, they'll be all arrogant. And God says, don't worry. This week I got them carrying trees through airport security, building huts in the backyard, and annoying everybody at Home Depot. It's going to be fine. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's been a, by the way, the fact that I'm actually performing for a live audience is really incredible because the last three years I've been performing over Zoom, and the fact that I'm not staring at a bunch of old ladies' nostrils who don't know how to use a webcam is pretty incredible, okay? Like, I've been for three years, and has the comedian started yet? <laughs> how are you not wearing pants? How are Ethel? You guys have been unmuted the whole time. But, uh, <laughs> no, but, but listen, the last few years have been dicey. You know, it, it's, uh, I, I think we're not, you know, the, the amount of the educational, you know, changes that have had to be made or the, you know, the gaps in some education is going to be, we're not going to find out until later in the year, especially that March to June of 2020, right when COVID started. There's going to be a huge gap in people's knowledge that we're not going to find out until later in life when somebody's going to be at a job and somebody's going to say, you know, for just a fraction of the cost, we could save a lot of money. And one guy's going to raise his hand and say, I'm sorry, what's a fraction? I missed three months of 2020. Was that important? <laughs> but I, what I realized March of 2020, what it did was it turned everybody Chabad in a way. In the sense that we lost all sense of timing. We were drinking a little bit more. We weren't shaving. Everywhere we went was kind of scary, but kind of exciting. And every day I had to ask myself, did you put on tefillin today? So, thank you. Um, no, but I, listen, as an Orthodox Jew, a lot of times, you know, you have to explain like holidays to people. It's very, very difficult, you know, especially the years like this, the, this, this year, for example, when you, you know, I, I just left my job and it's very hard to take off in September, and October for holidays. I mean, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I would call them name brand holidays. People know those, but if you want to take off for work, for like, you know, Sukkot or Sukkot, it's very hard because you already missed Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which happened to be after Labor Day anyway. And now you want to take off another few days. You have to walk in your manager's office, you know, and be like, so I'm going to need a couple days off this week. Yeah, that's fine. You'll just make up the time the week after. <laughs> I'm going to need two days after that. Why, what's that holiday called? Uh, happiness of the Torah? Well, that, that just sounds made up. But don't worry, there's like no holidays for like six months, but I will need to leave by three on Fridays. And uh, it's also extra hard when you work in a company that has people that are Jewish also, but they're not necessarily observant. So then you get that whole thing of like, the manager, you know, the boss is like, I don't understand, why, why do you have to leave so early? You know, why do you have to take these days off? Like Steinberg's Jewish, and you're like, you don't understand, I'm crazy. And um, <laughs> so, no, but, but I would say Shabbat, Shabbos has gotta be the hardest thing to explain to people that aren't Jewish, I would say. Because it, it, especially in the winter when Shabbos, you know, Friday, sunset on Friday afternoon is like 4.30, you know, uh, we're, we're, or 5 o'clock right now. And it's, a, it's actually later than it's been. In December, it's like really tough. And I don't know how to tell people. They're like, what do you, you know, why can't you, why, why do you have to leave work so early? You're like, because at sunset, I become Amish. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, because they're like, do you drive? No. Do you like, use electricity? No. Do you go to the bathroom? I'm like, technically, no. Like, you know, it's really, and, and you know, the plus, like, the verse in the Torah, it says about Shabbos, it says, six days of the week you shall work, and the seventh day you shall play board games and have arguments about things you could have Googled. And that's a real, <laughs> the rabbi's like, that's not a real thing. But, uh, but uh, my favorite thing of Shabbos has to be something called Amir al This is when, this is a, a thing where you, you're, you're not supposed to tell, you want a non-Jew to do something for you, but you're not supposed to tell them, I want you to do this. You have to hint to them. It's like God's way of saying, if you're going to cheat and use a loophole, I want this to be as hilarious as possible. So like you forgot to turn your air conditioner on. You're like, hey, is it hot in here? Are you hitting on me? <laughs> Honey, I think we're going to have to find a new neighbor. Or, or you want to you want to you to kill a bug for you. You're not supposed to kill a bug on, on, on Shabbos. And now you have to... You have to want a Nanju to kill a bug for you. You're not supposed to tell them I need you to kill this bug. Now you have to pretend like you're in the mafia performing a hit. You see this thing? 
I want it gone. Do you want me to kill it? I don't want to know any details. Just have to take care of. But my favorite thing of Shabbos has to be something called Jewish five cycle. Regular five cycles when food falls on the floor, you know, women quit about five seconds, they can still eat it. Guys quit about three weeks and they can still eat it. <laughs> Jewish five cycle is when you go to the bathroom on Shabbos and you leave the bathroom, you turn the light over, like, oh shoot, five cycle, turn right back on. <laughs> and uh, that's what the rabbi's like, no, also not a real thing. Yeah, every time he's going to make a disclaimer. And um, no, it's, it, you know, it, it's, you know, Rabbi, we have this week's Parsha is coming up is, is Parsha Yitzro, which is about Moshe's, you know, it's the Ten Commandments, but Moshe's father-in-law actually, Moses' father-in-law shows up. And before he showed up, actually everybody, all of the Israelites would wait to ask Moses a question. And so they'd be waiting all day. And then Yitzro decided to tell him, hey, this is a, I have a better idea. But it literally says in the Torah, um, Yitzro says to him, Moshe, the thing you're doing is not good. And that teaches you such a powerful lesson. That means, I mean, you can free an entire people from slavery and you'll still be criticized by your in-laws. So that is, <laughs> um, but also, you know, I, I, flew, I flew this morning to get here and uh, I flew once without, you know, with my son when he was one year old without my wife. And I realized there's such a difference you get um, as a, the treatment on a plane as a man with a baby versus a woman with a baby on a plane. A woman with a baby on a plane, people are like, you better keep that baby quiet. Yeah. But a man with a baby on the plane, people are like, God bless you, sir. You know, we thank you for your service. Uh, you're a hero. They've been announced when they said we want to have pre-boarding for elderly veterans and men who are clearly inept without their wives. And, um, no, but I, uh, my, my son was born, when my, my son's five years old. He was born with a lot of hair. Uh, I was pretty jealous. And then he started losing his hair. And then he had his circumcision. And then my mother-in-law started talking about how he was getting a double chin. So I turned to my son and I said, you know, you're balding, you're circumcised, and relatives are obsessed with your weight. Welcome to the Jewish people. <laughs> you're a member of the tribe. But uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end on this note here that um, a few years ago, the final word in the National Spelling Bee was the word canadal. This was the winning word in the National Spelling Bee. And this Indian kid won. And I feel so bad for him because he probably studied the dictionary backwards and forwards. How did that go down? And, you know, you probably decided the dictionary backwards and forwards and they just throw a Yiddish word at him. That doesn't seem fair. I wonder how that went down. They're just like, all right, your final word is the word canadal. Can you use it in a sentence, please? <laughs> sure. Canadal. During Shulchan Arach, <laughs> at my Pesach Seder, my bubby always makes sure to put an extra canadal in my matzo ball soup because my family eats gebrux, canadal. <laughs> Were any of those real words? Anyways, my name is Ellie Lee Woods. Thank you so much. And, yeah. Ma'am, I have to ask you to move to the rear of the bus. When, you, when you've done these venues, have you done um, have you done fundraisers for the big organizations like APAC or Stand With Us? Have you been in one of those fundraisers? Or are these mostly synagogue fundraisers and stuff like that? Not yet. Uh, <laughs> like I don't know. I you know I, I listen. I really try to promote the idea that there's a lot of hilarity about Judaism, and there's so many things. And I find that sometimes in Jewish media, like you know, um, there's a lot of like I don't know typical big old humor and it's a little too cliche for me and I really try to get into the weeds of like really like Jew Jewish life and making jokes about that so any any audience that has a Jewish background I'm, I'm open to perform for. Great, them. great. Well we're looking forward to hearing you again. Uh, the studio audience here. Uh, I'm so happy you're all here because we're all excited to hear Ali Lieberts. Uh, no, the, thank you again. Uh, some of you are like, I gotta go to the bathroom. But uh, I, here's here's the thing that I, I find the hardest to ex to explain to people um, as an Orthodox Jew is the idea of kosher vacation. Because you talk to people who who aren't Jewish who, who don't keep kosher, 
And they like, they're like, yeah, we went on vacation and we just, you know, like, we just ate whatever we wanted. And I'm just like, I went on vacation and I ate whatever I brought in my suitcase. You know? <laughs> like, when you keep kosher, going on vacation isn't really, like, keep, a kosher vacation is just eating tuna in another city, okay? <laughs> like, oh, I've never had deli at the Grand Canyon before. Like, you know, people will say, like, oh, you know, we went on this uh, great place that, you know, we went to Ibiza, we went to this nice little cafe, and I'm just like, you know, I also went to Spain and I could barely finish my tradition soups like you know it's it's just a different and even don't don't bring also kosher restaurants I don't really it's very hard like explaining kosher restaurants to people too just like it's when you take someone to a kosher restaurant who doesn't keep kosher you kind of have to like preface like almost like apologize like you're bringing them to a, like a racist relative you're just like hey I'm so sorry that you're gonna get yelled at in Hebrew by this guy but like, you know and the ambiance is just there's no ambiance there's no theme the theme is kosher you know there's a restaurant in Teaneck New Jersey called Noah's Ark which serves every animal that was on Noah's Ark you know if it wasn't for just milk and meat as an issue every kosher restaurant would serve every food possible you know and and again the ambiance is, is the decorum is just like you know non-kosher restaurants, restaurants are like you know we have a piano bar and kosher Restaurants like we have a four-year-old climbing on top of the bar, and that's just that's just the reality of of what we have as you know as Jews. But uh, I mean, eating is a very big part of you know Jewish life. I'm impressed that so many people came to this you know to this live event, even though there's no food. I mean, you you mo no, most of the time you need food to get Jews to come. You don't even have to agree with what the the event is. People will come if you tell them there's food. I mean, you could have an event called like the Merits of Louis Farrakhan. People will be like, "Will there be sushi? I should at least <laughs> check it out." And, uh, but we eat, we eat a ton as Jews, you know, we eat all the time. I mean, I'll, I'll see somebody jogging, I'll think to myself, why can I do that? I'll never remember, oh yeah, I'm on my way to Dunkin' Donuts. That's probably why. <laughs> my friend told me he went, he ran five miles once. I was like, wow, there's a Dunkin' Donuts five miles from here. That is unbelievable. And, uh, no, but like, by, by the way, especially here in Chicago, a Dunkin' Donuts after Pesach is like a mob scene. I don't know, it's, 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 it's insane. You know, in the original version of The Lion King, Mufasa gets killed outside a stampede after, you know, after Pesach at a Dunkin' Donuts. Like, you know, I, the, the, the cashier asked me, she said, how long was everyone fasting for? And I'm like, oh, you don't understand. We've been eating this whole time, just not this food. And, uh, but, but it's just, you know, and eating is just such a part of our lives. You know, we, uh, we eat on Hanukkah. Hanukkah, we eat the oiliest foods, and that's on purpose because the Hanukkah is all the battle against Greek culture, and the Greeks were all about man being in prime physical shape. So on Hanukkah, we eat oily foods to ensure we never become like the Greeks. Okay, I am very proud of my heritage. Now pass me a jelly donut or six. And uh, no, it's it, it's really you know I, I'm so out of shape that I get winded when something jogs my memory. You know, if I'm in the gym and somebody says, "How much do you bench?" I'm like, I don't know. The first paragraph was it Shabbos. What do you do? And uh, <laughs> I want to relate it with people, I guess. Uh, no, but also, like, listen, I do try to have, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, you know, the holidays that we have. I mean, there's nothing weirder than after Yom Kippur when somebody who isn't Jewish comes up to you and says, I hope you had a nice holiday. Do you know what I was doing yesterday? Ay, 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 I'm cold, I'm hungry, I'm a bad person. All together now. Ay, ay, ay. And, uh... You know, that's because we have the Asham news, which is the alphabetical list of things we've done wrong. That's how Jews do things alphabetically. So, you know, Asham news. Like, the one that scares me the most as a comedian is called Lots New, because that means we have made a mockery of serious things. I mean, that's kind of why I was invited tonight. Uh, but, like, literally everyone else is just like Asham new, but I'm the only one who's just like Lots New, Lots New, this is going to be a while, Lots New. And I was reading the back of the Art Scroll uh, Yom Kippur Mopser because I wanted to feel extra guilty. <laughs> and uh, they have whole paragraphs, for, it's, it's somewhere here. You have a whole paragraphs of each of the uh, Ashamnus, and for Latsnu, it literally says, you have made a mockery of serious things. People have taken things less seriously because of you. People have been entertained by your witticisms to no end. I was reading this thinking to myself, you know, I should post this on my website. This is pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I really do try to have a really inspirational Yom Kippur Davening. It's really tough, though. I'm like you, you know, I'm counting the pages, dividing by two. I'm like, oh, like, it may taste amazing to break your fast, but it's nothing like realizing 100 page food stuff is really only 50 pages. It is great. You know, you get mad at the Chazin and read something that's not bolded, you're like, dude, what are you doing? We could be eight pages further by now. And it says, some shuls say these paragraphs. You're like, please don't be some shuls, please. Is there any sweeter words in Jewish liturgy than most congregations omit this? Okay, like, come on. And, uh, 
<laughs> no, it's just, you know, I, I just, you know, and, and I mentioned, you know, uh, flying, I flew to Israel this, uh, this summer, I flew Al Al, because uh, I forgot what it was like to fly Al Al. And uh, the LL Airlines, you know, they're, they're, it's a great airline, you know, um, but uh, there were, you know, I forgot what the LL experience was like. There were like babies crying, people davening, people asking for money, people smoking. It was like somebody took the subway in New York and was like, let's make this a 12 hour experience. And, you know, uh, one time I asked the crowd, I say, anybody fly LL recently? One woman yells out, never again. And I couldn't help myself. I said, I'm pretty sure that's not their slogan. And, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> Complaints can be mailed to Rabbi Doug. Uh, but uh, I you know, but LL, LL has you know they have this uh, this the tagline for LL. According on the plane, it says LL. Uh, it's not an airline. It's Israel. And I feel like a more accurate slogan for LL would be LL. It's not an airline. It's an egged bus with wings. You know, <laughs> it's a kosher restaurant just with bigger bathrooms. And uh, but like you know the LL security people, they have this nice disarming Hebrew, they have these, these questions which are designed to make you feel like this is going to be a safe flight, but all it does is make you feel like a bad Jew. You ask you these questions, do you know what Parsha it is? <laughs> <laughs> um, something in Egypt. Uh, I didn't know this was going to be on the final. Uh, or they ask you, uh, the other one, um, where do you go to shul, where do you go to synagogue? And you're like, there's a place I go to for Kiddush. Uh, <laughs> you're not telling my parents about this, are you? <laughs> it's a non-religious Israeli guy. Where do you go to shul, Israeli guy? <laughs> or they ask you the other one. I still, they ask you this. They say, who are you visiting in Israel? Where are you visiting? And you're like, oh, shoot, listen. I did not tell those relatives that I was coming, okay? We just keep this. Uh, this is supposed to be a quick trip, okay? I do not have time to bring Listerine and Ziploc bags to my cousins at Beit Shemesh, okay? Like, I still am amazed that they still ask this question. They say, did anyone ask you to bring anything? And you're like, only every person I've ever met. <laughs> I have an entire suitcase just of stuff people ask me to bring. Like, seriously? That's why I was so excited when they had the Bray Sheet Moon Lander a few years ago, this Moon Lander that was an unmanned mission to the moon. But it gives me hope that one day there's going to be Israelis going to the moon, and I can't wait for that press conference where they're going to say, you know, we're, the first, we're so excited to be the first Israelis to go to the moon. And one person's going to raise their hand and say, can you bring a few things to the moon with you? Just a couple small packages. My son's in yeshiva there. It would be really nice. <laughs> and, but I, 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 on a semi-serious note, you know, I think it's really, you know, the, the, the criticism that Israel gets, you know, Israel is really the only democracy in the Middle East. I mean, you know it's true. They have an election every week. And, uh, <laughs> and it's not like things in the U.S. are so great either right now, either. I mean, you know things are rough when shuls in Israel are saying, let's say, a prayer for the United States. I mean, you know. And I just think that the criticism of Israel is just unfair because there are legitimate things to criticize Israel about. Just do it accurately and honestly, okay? Don't criticize Israel by saying it's an apartheid state because it's not. Criticize Israel for being this close to curing cancer, but can't figure out how to serve peace on anything more than a cardboard slab, okay? Like, don't criticize Israel for doing ethnic cleansing. It doesn't do that. Criticize Israel for being the startup nation and technology, but still hasn't made it past the squeegee. You know, don't <laughs> criticize Israel for going against the UN. Criticize Israel for going against health standards, but I think it's okay to have a cat working at a shawarma stand, okay? That's <laughs> my point. And uh, with that, I will wish you all a Purim Samath. I hope this is released on Purim, or else that's a really awkward send off. Um, thank you very much. You have been great. My name is Ellie Lee Woods. Thank you so much for being on the show. You are so funny. Oh, thank you. Really you. I, and, and I love that you kind of look at who's here and target your, your, your comedy to the audience, which is great. And uh, um, for those of you who don't understand anything, just send an email and we'll explain it completely. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being with us too. Remember, you can check out our website, www.tvramai.com. You can also see former shows on the web. If you want to send Ellie an email, you can email us at info at tvrabbi.com. I'll forward it to him, and I know he'll personally get back to you and send you any other information about his future uh, uh, engagements that he can. And uh, hope to see you all next time and next week right here on Tape with Rabbi Doug. Shalom, everyone. This has been a Taped with Rabbi Doug production.